Good morning. Uh, unfortunately, my colleague uh, Yochi Fischer uh, got the flu. She is uh, Yochi is the is the heading here uh, the division for advanced studies at Van Leer Institute, and uh, we are going to miss her. But among between uh, Rabbi Korn and myself, we shall try to uh, organize uh, this uh, session. Uh, and uh, we also want to apologize. We are very sorry not to have with us uh, uh, Professor Robert uh, Jensen, uh, that uh, he co uh, uh, co chaired uh, together with Rabbi Korn our group that worked together in the last uh, two years. Uh, but we are going to begin this session by hearing the presentation of uh, Professor uh, uh, Robert Jensen, so I will say a few words about him. Uh, Robert Jensen is co-director with Eugene Cord of the Institute for Theological Inquiry. He has taught a, a systematic theology and philosophy at Oxford, Notre Dame, and Princeton Universities. Uh, his, uh, he was uh, the senior uh, scholar for research at the Center of, for Theolo Theological Inquiry in Princeton for eight years. Besides his uh, two volume works, Systematic Theology, he is the author or co-author of uh, 17 books. He was a co-founder and longtime associate director of the Center for... Uh, Ah, uh, Catholic and uh, evangel Evangelical Theology, and co-founder um, and long-time editor and co-editor of the journals uh, Dialogue and Pro... Was it? Ecclesia. Ecclesia, okay. No, it's something uh, not clear. Uh, most recently, he has written uh, commentaries on Song of Songs and, Eze and uh, Ezekiel. He is the conviction of Christianity uh, needs a theological understanding of Judaism and that Christian and Jews, thinkers, must work together on shared theological questions. The topic for the presentation of uh, Professor Jensen is what kind of God can make a covenant? Please. First, I have to apologize for inflicting on you this mode of conversation. When it came down to it, when tickets had to be bought, I had to admit that I was not up to long distance travel at the moment. It's a personal disappointment for me and a problem for you. Why did I choose this topic? I guess it was because I often choose some topic of the, some, some aspect of the doctrine of God or have it chosen for me. Perhaps I may be allowed a moment of spiritual autobiography. On the one hand, prayer of thanksgiving and petition has from childhood been natural for me. I just did it, silently or out loud, and indeed it's still that way. On the other hand, from the beginning of my reflection about such things, I was puzzled about what sort of being I supposed myself to be speaking to. And then one day, the scripture, and particularly what Christians call the Old Testament, came alive for me. So my question became, what kind of God do the narratives and laws and prophecies of scripture portray? It will be seen that the paper before you simply poses one aspect of that question. It did, however, require some new thinking. For in the theological tradition from which I come, the notion of covenant does not have a decisive place, despite its prominence in the scripture. Now that differentiates my paper from the others in this group. Rabbis Korn and Rotenberg are, of course, at home with covenant, however much they may otherwise disagree. Whereas, for me, I was driven back to basic theology. So the question of my paper when I sat down to write it was a real one for me. What kind of God could and would make a covenant? The paper opens with the observation that the various candidates for the title of God are indeed of various kinds. 
And then quickly, perhaps too quickly, it proceeds to analysis of why we posit gods in the first place. And why the putative gods are real, if they are, in different ways. You may or may not find my analyses illuminating, and I do not think you will divide them on confessional lines. The first step of my proposed answer to the question that is my title is that by the dominant standard of our culture, still controlled as it is by the thinking of the great Greek pagan theologians, the God who could make a covenant would be a very odd sort of God. This too reflects the re recent renewed discussion both among Jews and Christians of how we are to navigate the dual inheritance of our theologies from those whom we are usually going to call the philosophers and from scripture. And the first character of this oddity is that a God who would make a covenant would be a God who creates. That is, who willingly instigates an actual other than himself. For if God is to make a covenant, there must be someone with whom to make it. And neither can the being of this other be independent of God, nor yet can this God's relationship to that other be such as to threaten either its reality or its otherness. The gods of the nations do not so relate to the realities they engender. To put the matter much more abruptly than I do in the paper, in one way or another, the religions receive, conceive the gods and other reality as embraced together within an overarching system. For an example that was pretentious for the West, the gods of the Greeks and their human counterparts were indeed distinguished because the gods were immortal and the, we others were not. But both were subject to impersonal fate, to a universal rule that was at once capricious and necessary. Next step. A covenant may be unilaterally established by one agent, but between the purposes of that agent and the mandates laid upon the other by those purposes, the covenant establishes a future shared by both parties. The great motto of the covenant with Israel states this. I will be your God, and you will be my people. The covenant maker himself acquires a joint history with his other. He is himself involved in that history. In scripture, this involvement is very dramatically portrayed, and in a variety of ways, by the structure of narratives, but not least striking are those, are figures, persons, that are at once themselves participant in the history of God with his people, and are as such initially distinguished from the author of that history, it in the course of the narrative turn out to be that Lord himself. Perhaps most notably the angel of the Lord, who in the many stories in which he figures, is invariably at first a messenger of the Lord, distinguished by that preposition or construct formulation. But before the end of the story speaks not for the Lord, but as the Lord. When the Lord's Shekinah, the Lord's residing in Israel, departs from the temple in Ezekiel's vision, the Lord departs. And when he returns, the Lord returns. In a rabbinic passage that everyone loves to quote, when the Lord redeems Israel in whom the Shekinah resides, he redeems himself. Finally, a God who could and would make a covenant must not be only a God who creates and who is involved with his creatures, must be a God who can be petitioned. And that gets me back to my initial remarks. Since a covenant maker and those with whom he makes covenant have a common history, 
Those with whom covenant is made must have their own voice within that relation, unless they are simply to be protected slaves. And since in this case, the covenant maker is the creator, the one on whom our lives in every instant depend, that voice will be predominantly the voice of petitionary prayer and grave thanksgiving. Comprehensively stated, having gone through those steps, a God who can make a covenant is not timeless, as the metaphysical tradition specifies. Such a God is indeed eternal, but not by being immune to time, or indeed lacking time, as did the high deity of the great Greek thinkers. Saying this does not deny God's eternity. But the question is, how does a particular alleged divinity transcend time? For each candidate for the God position does it differently. What then is the Lord's particular eternity? It seems to me that in Scripture, the eternity of God is his faithfulness. He is faithful in his history with his creatures, faithful in his history with us. And it is in this way that he is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. That he is triumphantly faithful is the fact of his eternity. Now in the paper, the next long session, section laments the difficulty Christian theology has had in maintaining a biblical apprehension of God's eternity. In maintaining an understanding of God's eternity, the Lord's eternity, as faithfulness in his history with us. Plato's questions and Aristotle's questions and our great and still going confrontation with them have been a great blessing. But their construal of what it takes to be God, their construal of deity, that it is a permanent and ineluctable immunity to what goes on in time, has been a constant seduction. And at this point I incautiously slip into Maimonides to suggest that perhaps a Jewish theology has sometimes had an analogous problem. Finally, on this line of reflection, I invoke a notion that has been central to my theology. A history between, on the one hand, a covenant maker who is absolutely faithful and a covenant partner who is only intermittently so, as we have been, will cohere in the way a drama does. Its coherence will be what I call dramatic coherence. Indeed, the faithfulness of the one partner will have the same character. The faithfulness of the God partner will not be a static changelessness but a life which is coherent because it too has a dramatic structure. Aristotle once put his finger on what seems to me to be the key point. A good story, Aristotle said, is one where before a thing happens you can't predict that it's going to. But when it has happened, you know it was absolutely the only thing that would have fitted. Now, Aristotle didn't think that the world had that structure because he thought it had no change. But it seems to me that uh, they, we can adapt his maxim to an understanding of the coherence of the life of the covenant-making God. The paper has two parts that are, in effect, appendices. As I say at the beginning of the first such section, it will have been apparent that I had been sneaking up on the Christian doctrine of Trinity. 
And I do at the very end take up the question of what relation the claim of the church to be in covenant with the God of Israel as to Israel's own covenant. So that makes two appendices. In the first draft of the paper, I was so concerned for Jews and Christians to think together about what kind of God could make a covenant that I stopped short of the Trinity doctrine, which for Christians constitutes and concludes our reflection about the God who could make a covenant. It was in particular response to Rabbi Rotenberg and his insistence that I gave up on that reticence. Now, I do not expect to convince Jews that the doctrine of the Trinity is a good idea. My discussion of it in the paper hopes only to make it slightly more comprehensible, in part by clarifying what it really asserts. Rarely, I have to say in my experience, grasped by Jewish colleagues who criticize it. In the course of that effort, I claim that the real division between Judaism and Christianity is the resurrection. But the real division between Christianity is about a matter, Jewish and Christianity is about a matter of fact. Did the God of Israel raise his servant Jesus from the dead, or did he not? If he did, then it seems to me that the division, that the other divisions between Jews and Christians follow simply as consequences of that great dissensus. Perhaps that claim that the real division is not the doctrine of Trinity as such or the problem about the observance of Jewish law, that the real division from which all else stems is the facticity or non-facticity of the resurrection. Perhaps that might be a good subject for the group to discuss for a few minutes. And then there is a second appendix Appendix, which is actually marked as such in the paper. It is devoted to a question which came up more than once in our discussions and which seems to me to divide the positions of Rabbis Korn and Rotenberg. What is the relation of the covenant with the God of Israel claimed by the church and Israel's own covenant with him? The suggestion put forward is, is that if the Lord's makings and renewings of his covenant and our receptions of his covenant follow the logic of drama so that their unity is dramatic so that we are not locked into logic that dictates that the covenant claimed by the church either is or simply is not included in Israel's covenant or sharing in it or whatever, then it seems to me that the ancient problem is not necessarily solved, but at least becomes somewhat easier to discuss. Perhaps that suggestion, too, might be worth some part of your group's discussion. So, there are the main points, some of the motivation, some summaries of the paper before you, and I thank you again for your attention and apologize again for this mode of communication. I thank you. I'd like to thank uh, Professor Robert Jensen. Uh, we miss you very much. Uh, we want to learn from you as we learn uh, during the work in uh, Princeton and uh, in, uh, in Yale and in Efrat, and we hope that we'll have a future opportunities here at Van Leer and in the center at Efrat to learn from you more and to have you with us in the Holy Land. Our next sp uh, speaker is Rabbi Dr. Eugene Korn. Eugene Korn is a co-director with Robert Jensen of the Institute for Theological Inquiry and the American Director of the Center for Jewish Christian Understanding and Cooperation in Israel. He holds doctorate in moral philosophy from Columbia University.
and was ordained by the Israeli rabbinate. Ah, so we can accept you here. Uh, this I didn't know. He is the author of the Jewish connection to the land of Israel, a brief introduction for Christians uh, in uh, published in Jewish Lights, and uh, Land and Covenant, uh, the religious significance of the State of Israel. He is co-edited third editions of End of Exile by James Par Parks, uh, uh, two, uh, f two faces, one covenant, uh, and Jewish uh, th theology and world uh, religions. He was published over 30 scholarly essays on the Jewish ethics and Jewish Christian relations, most uh, uh, recently, Rethinking Christianity, Rabbinic uh, Positions and uh, Possibilities in uh, Jewish Theology and World Religions, American Jewish Interface Relations in the, mm -hmm, in the Future of American Judaism, uh, Orthodoxy, Contemporary Pluralism, and the, and the Christian Other uh, in uh, Mishpetei Shalom, and Divine Commands, uh, Genocide, and Amalek, uh, Moralization in Jewish Law, the Eda, in the Eda Journal. He also edits Me'orot, a former uh, forum for uh, modern uh, Orthodox uh, discourse. The title of the presentation of Rabbi Kohn is The People of Israel, Christianity, and, conventional, and the Conventional. Rabbi Kohn, the floor is yours. Thank you, Naftali. Uh, thank you for the kind words. That was an introduction that uh, only my mother would believe and even my father would be proud of. Um, uh, the title of my paper is The People Israel, Christianity, and the Covenantal Responsibility to History. And I'm concerned with two essential questions. The first, is what theology is implied by the Torah's description of God's covenant with the Jewish people? And the second is, can Jewish believers see Christians as playing a role in the Jewish covenant? And uh, just a word before I begin on the analysis of my spiritual biography. Um, for those of you who were here last night and heard uh, Rabbi Weinfeld, I'm also in the box, as he put it. That is, I come from the Beit Midrash, Orthodox Beit Midrash, that focused almost exclusively on uh, diktuke halakha, on understanding the commandments and the halakha. And it was a Beit Midrash, it is a Beit Midrash, which sees Christianity as the enemy. And if Judaism was true, everything about Christianity had to be false. So that's the, um, my educational biography to a certain extent. And uh, when I began to examine things, um, I came to the conclusions uh, that I will present uh, to you in a moment that I thought were absolutely were, were impossible. Um, I, even five years ago, I never would have said the things um, that I will say now. And I say them because I believe that they're true, and even more than being true, I think they're critically important for us today. Now, Rambam, Maimonides, um, is the foremost amongst uh, Jewish rationalists, uh, all of whom insist that God's commandments, the mitzvot, are rational, which means that they have to have some purpose beyond themselves. Rational human action is action or behavior with the desired end. So when Rambam says that mitzvot are rational, what he means is that the commandments also must have a purpose and be commanded with a constructive end uh, in God's mind. So the God of Breshit, who created the world that's characterized as tov, or tov ma'od, um, cannot be arbitrary with the mitzvot that he commands his children. Or to argue that mitzvot have no rational purpose is, in fact, uh, to diminish God right, and make of him 
a whimsical dictator who would order his children around simply to parade his authority over them. Now, if that's true of individual mitzvot, of the individual commandments, it must be true of the entire system of mitzvot as a whole. That is, the entire system of mitzvot, which I will call the covenant, uh, must be part of some rational divine plan or rational divine economy uh, with an o overarching purpose that transcends the mitzvot themselves. And it's precisely this end, this telos, which gives coherence to the Torah's account of creation, which is a universalistic picture, um, together with the particularistic <coughs> account and relationship between God and the Jewish people. It's this overarching end that gives the covenant theological significance beyond legal significance and endows the Jewish people with a purpose in history and redeems us and the covenantal life, the life of mitzvot, from what I would call tribalistic limitations. Now, the, Torah's, the Torah itself, this is true not only from the point of view of, of, of Jewish philosophy or Jewish theology, but it's true in the Torah's own account of uh, the covenant and God's relationship with Am Yisrael. In the very text that establishes God's covenant with Abraham, with Abraham, God preserves the divine concern for all of his children when he commands or articulates to Abraham to interact with all of humanity. He says in Bereshit Yud Bet, bracha, Abraham, you should be a bracha, bacha And Abraham, you and your children, the Jewish people, must be a blessing for all the families of the earth. That is, Abraham and his descendants are challenged to play a role in universal human history. God's covenant with the Jewish people demands that we be neither a parochial people, nor a ghetto people, nor relegated to some insignificant footnote in the story of human history. The broad covenantal mission is so important in the Torah's plan for Jewish, for Am Yisrael, that it's mentioned not only in Bereshit Yud Bet, the first time that Avraham really uh, and God strike out the foundation for the covenant, but it's mentioned four other times, twice more to Avraham, and then when the, when the Brit is bequeathed to Yitzchak, Avraham's son, it's mentioned, and then it's mentioned for the last time with Yaakov. So the Torah stresses this universal purpose of the Jewish people five times in the book of Genesis. Now, the Torah doesn't really say what Avraham's mission was. And I would say this over, overarching purpose of the covenant is the Jewish mission. Jews don't like to use that term. It was mentioned last night because Christianity has appropriated that term. And the Torah really doesn't tell us what the mode of bracha is. It doesn't tell us what Avraham was really supposed to do, but in fact, the classical rabbis have filled in the gaps here. And they understood, the consensus of traditional rabbinic commentators and thinkers was that Avraham and Avraham's children, who were supposed to emulate Avraham, are to spread the knowledge of God throughout the earth and teach divine moral values to the world as fundamental to all human welfare. That is, God, Avraham was seen as the person who taught that the God of heaven was also involved in the, in the affairs of human beings and taught the world the Sheva Mitzvot B'nai Noach, the fundamental moral laws that Rabbi Riskin discussed last night. Um, that was Avraham's mission. Um, and in fact, if you believe the Rambam's account of this, it was Av God charged Avraham to reteach humanity what was lost in its spiritual what, what was lost in, in humanity's spiritual descent that went from Adam to Noah and from Noah to Avraham. Right? The covenantal task of Avraham's children was to be a partner with God in bringing the nations of the world to their spiritual and moral fulfillment, right? This is the mission of the Jewish people. 
We are supposed to bear witness. Again, another Christian term that Jews don't like to use, but I think if it was good enough for Isaiah, if it was good enough for Yeshayahu, who, spoke, who called the Jewish people in the name of God, says, Adiatem, you are my witnesses. So if it's good enough for Isaiah, if it's good enough for Abraham, it should be good enough for Jews in Jerusalem and Jews in New York, and even Jews in Borough Park, Brooklyn, or, uh, or Meya Sharim, Yerushalayim. And in fact, this is what the Torah means at the revelation at Sinai in Parshat Shemot, right before revelation, God says, if you will faithfully obey me and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession, and am amongst all people. For all the earth is mine, says God, but you, the Jewish people, shall be for me a kingdom of priests, mamlechet konim, and a holy nation, a goy kadosh. Now we'll talk a bit about what does it mean to be a nation of priests. First of all, what is a, the primary function of priests? The Torah tells us the primary function of priests, at least in the post-temple era, was to bless the people. And we still have this beautiful custom today where the Kohanim bless the congregation. Um, in Yerushalayim, every morning, the Kohanim say, you know, the famous bracha, the birkat Kohanim, uh, that's found in uh, Sefer Bamidbar. Okay. So the function of the priest is to bless the community. Now, let's think about what does it mean to be a mamlechet Kohanim? If all of the Jewish people are supposed to be kodim and supposed to bless, it can only be the nations of the world that the Jewish people are called upon to bless. Right? So thus, in, in Revelation at Sinai itself, there is God's message to the Jewish people to perform the function of blessing all of humanity. And thus, Sinai is connected very much to Abraham. And that is why in rabbinic literature, Abraham is described very frequently as being a Kohen, as being a priest, which should make you stop and think, how could Abraham be a Kohen right, when he preceded by many generations the whole institution of the priesthood? Hazal, the rabbi, saw that Abraham performed the priestly function by being an agent of blessing to all the world around him. And as it was quoted last night by Professor Novak and Rabbi Riskin, this is exactly what Yeshayahu means when he refers to the Jewish people as or lagoyim, a light of the nations or a light to the nations. Um, now, if we are supposed to play this universal role be the critical actor in human history, how is it that Jews today don't see themselves as performing that, religious Jews don't see themselves as performing that function? Living the covenant requires intense focus on performing the mitzvot. And, and therefore, much of Jewish religious life is focused only on those mitzvot behavioral commandments um, that, the, that in a certain sense could lead one to think that the Jewish people as a Goy Kadosh should be separate and should be a nation that dwells alone. And certainly Jewish historical experience in exile amongst the nations kind of conduces to this withdrawal or isolationist religious philosophy because the truth is that Am Yisrael today is a traumatized people. Right? The deep wounds that we still feel that were inflicted by the harsh historical persecutions of Rome, of the church, of the czars, of the Nazis, of the communists, and the current widespread Muslim hostility to Israel easily lead some religious Jews um, and nationalist Jewish thinkers to idealize isolation from the world. It seems that whenever Jews got involved in the world, Jewish blood ran in the streets. 
And, th and therefore, it's quite natural to turn inward and to elevate survival above uh, survival as our primary religious value. You know, my, my wife's parents were Hasidic Jews who lived in Slovakia. And they had a little store, and the fact is that they closed their store during Holy Week, the week prior to Easter, because that was a time when Catholic, the Catholic community around them often uh, destroyed Jewish property and persecuted Jews. Well, in a certain sense, religious Jewry today um, is still enmeshed in that psychology. We are still um, inside the store that's closed off to the world. Sometimes I kind of jokingly refer to uh, religious Jews, myself included, as Amish with tzitzis. What do I mean by that? The Amish are very good people. I'm very close with a number of Amish people. But all they want is to be isolated, to, to, for the world to let them alone and for them to leave the world alone. That's their religious worldview. And sometimes, you know, we are like that Amish with tzitzis. But despite this historical tragedy, right, it's, it is the Torah's ideal for Jews to be a mamlechet koanim and to be an or lagoyim. Now, God's covenant with the Jewish people at Sinai would be meaningless right, without this historical mandate. Right? The divine covenant with individuals, it, it, God could have struck a divine covenant with individuals whose purpose is personal redemption, personal salvation. That's possible without a historical mission. But the God of history's covenant with an eternal people, Am Yisrael, assumes a purpose only if our people, our covenantal people, has an enduring mission over the sweep of time and of over human history. And for those of you who had a chance to read the papers uh, before this, this is my essential disagreement with Rabbi Rotenberg. Uh, my critique of his analysis is that he doesn't consider the divine mandate to be a blessing to the nations, v'nivrechu b'chak homishpachota adama, um, nor does he distinguish between the technical means of the covenant, that is the technical implementation of the covenant, which are mitzvot, right, from the purpose of the covenant, which is the theology of the covenant. Moreover, you know, such an account of the Brit doesn't take history seriously. That is, there's no historical role in God's creation for the Jewish people. Now let's talk a little bit about the Sinaitic covenant, or the Noahite covenant and the Abrahamic covenant. Um, the Sinai Covenant, Tariyag Mitzvot, or Torah to Moshe, right, is restricted to the Jewish people. It applies to us and to only us. Right? But that's not the end of Jewish theology. Right? Very early on, rabbis found a way or found a role for God's establishing a relationship with Gentiles and granting Gentiles who were outside the Sinaitic Covenant you know, theological legitimacy. And this is what was referred to last night as the Noahite covenant. God has, according to Jewish thought, Jewish theology, God has a covenant with all of humanity that is known as the Noahite covenant that are the fundamental principles of morality. Um, and that's an independent, legitimate covenant, right, so that one doesn't have to be Jewish to be saved, right, or to be beloved in the eyes of God. In fact, Rabbi Yaakov Emden, a great 18th century German uh, rabbinic authority said that a Gentile who observes the Noahite covenant is more beloved by God than a Jew who violates the Sinai covenant. Now at this point I'd like to ask a, a rather simple question. It's simple but I think profound. Was Abraham a Jew or was Abraham a Noahite? Well for those of us who have been schooled in traditional Jewish education, it's obvious that Abraham was the first Jew. He was not a Noahite. But if we ask the question in slightly different terminology, it was Abraham obligated by the Sinai commandments, by revelation at Sinai, by the mitzvot, or was he not? If we define a Jew as he who is obligated by the mitzvot, the commandments of Sinai, then it is clear from classical Jewish thinkers 
that Abraham was not a Jew. Abraham was not obliga obligated by those mitzvot, and nor did he keep those mitzvot. Right. To be more precise, that's the majority of commentators. There is a, one opinion in the Talmud that claims that Avraham kept all of the mitzvot, but I'm, I'm convinced that that is not to be taken literally. It was said for educational purposes. And that's clearly the minority of opinion. The minority opinion, if you look at all the medieval commentators, except for Rashi, they claim that Abraham did not keep the mitzvot. He kept the seven mitzvot of Noah, and he had belief in God. To be precise in theological language, Abraham was a theological Noahite. <coughs> he kept the seven mitzvot. He kept circumcision, possibly prayer. Right? But his major faith was based around living and teaching the seven mitzvot of Noah and teaching the world of the creator of heaven and earth. Now, in terms of how Christianity might fit into this Jewish notion of covenants, um, the truth is that rabbinic evaluation of Christianity has undergone an evolution. And there are four distinct periods. First, in the first and second century, certainly during the time when the early Christians were, in fact, Jews, Right. Jewish Christians were tolerated as a sect in the community, part of the Jewish community, and they came to regard, be regarded as heretics or minim right, when belief in Jesus as the Messiah and the New Covenant were considered to be illegitimate because, in fact, uh, the New Covenant had replaced the Old Covenant. Um, and they beca became known as, as minim or Heretics would, which would not be tolerated in the community. Um, and Christianity became known in halachic parlance as a vodazara, strange worship or foreign worship, which is often mistranslated, mistranslated as idolatry. It may include idolatry, but it is not limited to idolatry. It's simply foreign worship that is illegitimate, at least for Jews. In the Middle Ages, the early Middle Ages, when Jews lived amongst Christians, uh, the rabbis worked out a very skillful kind of compromise, the early rabbis. And for technical reasons, they found that Christians were not ovdei of Odazara, they were not uh, practitioners of, of Odazara, and therefore all of the Talmudic prohibitions regarding relating to, to Ovde uh, of Adazara did not apply to Christians. However, Christianity, because of the doctrine of the Trinity and the Incarnation, you know, constituted of Adazara, sometimes understood as idolatry. Uh, later in the Middle Ages, there was a more refined rabbinic view that understood that whereas the Trinity might be off limits for Jews and constitute illegitimate worship, it was perfectly permissible for Gentiles. And in fact, um, therefore, Christianity was not a vodazara for Gentiles. Perhaps it was for Jews. Certainly it was for Jews, according to these opinions. But for Gentiles, it was a perfectly legitimate form of, of worship and a perfectly legitimate religion. And from the 17th century onward, there began to arise a certain rabbinic opinion that said that Christianity, in fact, had a deep connection to Judaism because Christianity taught many of the fundamental principles of faith of Judaism. It taught about Bereshit Yeshmiyayin, Kriatio Ex Nihilo, that God created the world from nothing. It taught about revelation. It taught about the fundamental laws of Noah. And therefore, it wasn't that it was a completely separate religion from Judaism. There was some deep connection between Jewish principles of faith and Christianity. And in fact, some very traditional Orthodox rabbinic authorities had much praise for Christianity. This is what I never heard in my Beit Midrash. For instance, um, Rabbi Moshe Rifkis, who's known in, in the yeshiva world as the Bear Hagola, said the following. The Gentile, and he lived in Lithuania, so the Gentiles he's referring to are obviously Christians. The Gentiles in whose shadows Jews live today uh, are not idolaters, but they believe in Bereshit uh, 
Yeshmi Ayan, Creatio Ex Nihilo, in the Exodus from Egypt, and the main principles of our faith. Their intention is to uh, the creator of heaven and earth, and we are obligated to pray for their welfare. In the 18th century, the greatest rabbi of Germany, Rabbi Yaakov Emden, said the following, Jesus brought a double goodness to the world. Christians eradicated idolatry. They removed idols from the nations and obligated it, them, obligated the nations in the seven moral mitzvot of Noah. Were it not for Christianity, the world would behave like animals of the field. But Christianity instilled in them very firmly moral traits. And in the 19th century, Shimshon Raphael Hirsch said the following, Judaism stresses that while in, with respect to their views and way of life of Christians that may differ from Judaism, the peoples in whose midst Jews live, and this is 19th century Germany, so he's talking about Christians, right, have accepted the Jewish Bible and the Old Testament as a book of divine revelation. They profess their belief in God of heaven and earth as proclaimed in the Bible, and they acknowledge the sovereignty of the one God. Now, what these rabbinic opinions are saying is that Christians should be viewed positively because of their beliefs, not in spite of their beliefs. That's where they differed from the early rabbinic opinions of the Middle Ages. So it's clear that Judaism relates to Christianity not as a, simply a legitimate Noahide religion, the way we would relate to an, an Asian religion like Hinduism or Buddhism. But some, Christianity for Judaism must stand somewhere between the Noahide covenant and the covenant at Sinai. Right? They are not simply Noahites. Um, now, in effect, these rabbis are saying that Christianity has played a role in Abraham's covenant. If you look at the way the rabbis described the mission of Abraham, remember what I said it was? To bring the presence or the knowledge of the God, the one God who created the world to the peoples of the earth and to teach the fundamental laws of morality. That is exactly, exactly the terminology that is used by Rabbi Rifkus, by Rabbi Emden, by Rabbi Hirsch, exactly the description of Christianity. So in effect, what these rabbis are saying is that Christianity somehow is fulfilling the mission of Abraham. Rabbi Riskin, I think, made a very important um, distinction between Zerah Avraham and B'nai Avraham in his papers. Right? That, that Christians and Christianity may not be from the seed of Avraham genealogically, but spiritually and theologically, they are, should be seen as the children of Abraham in a very, very real sense, in a deep religious sense, not in a, in a, you know, a, a glib way. Now, I'll make two more points in conclusion. There were two problems with, historically for Jews to see, to share the covenant or the Abrahamic covenant with Christianity. This was seen as absolutely taboo historically. And the two problems were one, the theological problem, because of the doctrine of the Trinity and the Incarnation, which, were, which did violence to the Jewish notion of God that Jews could never accept. Um, that's theologically. Um, and historically, the, there was a deep problem. And this, I think, is the deepest problem rather than the theological one that every time that Christianity tried to assimilate Judaism, to say that they were the heirs of the Abrahamic covenant, and therefore Judaism was superseded. Judaism was replaced. So the notion of drawing closer to Christianity meant necessarily in Christian doctrine of hard supersessionism that Judaism was now obsolete and superseded and should be replaced and had no role in history. It was the suicide of Judaism. Therefore, since Jews never practiced or, or were particularly enamored by, with suicide, they went as far away as possible from this notion of sharing the covenant with Christianity. Today, however, we have the tools to, to overcome that.
we overcome the theological problem by the rabbinic distinction that Christianity is not a vodazara for, for Gentiles. It's perfectly legitimate and even salutary and positive and necessary, according to Rabbis Emden and Hirsch. That solves the theological problem. And the historical problem can be overcome because of the new turn in Christian theology toward Judaism. Most Christians do not practice or preach hard supersessionism. That is, they do not, today, they do not say that Christianity has replaced Judaism, but they practice some variety of what Professor Novak calls soft supersessionism. That is, Christianity may be superior to Judaism, but Judaism continues to play a role in uh, God's divine plan. Right? So that, that Jews are still in living covenant with God. Right? And once that happens, the threat of replacing Judaism is gone. And this is the, is the tremendous psychological and historical change that is, a, that is the result of a change in Christian theology. So Jews and Christian, in fact, can have a common mission. And with this, I'll close. What does this common mission entail? This common mission to both be, to live out the covenant of Abraham. I would say that Jews and Christians today are both threatened or in the crosshairs of two extremes. One extreme is radical secularism on the left, radical secularism and materialism, and the other extreme is religious irrationality and violence on the right. Both Judaism and Christianity are targets of such impulses, and neither can survive or thrive if those extremes become dominant in our culture and our politics. And therefore, Jews and Christians should give common testimony, the common testimony of Abraham. And with this, I'll close. What would that testimony look like? The following, I think. They, Jews and Christians should testify to number one, there is a spiritual center to the universe because the world was created by a, a God who loves his children and who is intimate, intimately involved in the lives of his children and who yearns to redeem his children. Jews and Christians together should be unembarrassed by giving testimony to this reality. Just as Abraham was not embarrassed to call the name of the Lord. If you read Genesis, you see that Abraham is constantly building an altar and calling the name of the Lord. Christians would call this witness. And Jews should probably also call it witness. Number two, as the creator, God is the transcendent authority over all human life. And he establishes the validity of moral values. Although sometimes moral values are difficult to apply, they're neither relative nor mere human conventions, but they're intrinsic parts of the universe that are essential, essential for human flourishing. The fundamental Noahite moral values must remain primary in all human endeavors. Number three, all persons are created in the image of God, but Selim Elohim in Imago Dei. And each person, therefore, has intrinsic sanctity that derives from this transcendent theological quality. All, purpose, all persons possess inherent dignity and must be treated as such. And because every person is created in the divine image, any assault on innocent human life is an assault on God himself, or God herself, or God itself. Right? And any assault on human life diminishes the Shina, the divine presence in our world. Number four, as Abraham learned from the binding of Isaac that God loves human life and abhors death, thus Abraham's covenantal children, us, Jews and Christians together, must, te must teach that killing in the name of God, all killing, any killing in the name of God, is contrary to the God of Abraham. And all forms of religious violence are idolatries that the world must reject. Number five, as Abraham def defended and taught justice and righteousness, Staka Mishpat, before the destruction of Stom and Amorah in Bereshit Yudchet, Genesis 18, his children, we, Jews and Christians together, are obligated to teach 
social justice and display individual righteousness. Our commitment to justice and to righteousness for all human creatures is the test of our faithfulness to God's covenant. And lastly, as faithful Jews and Christians who believe in the Messianic era, we must teach the eternal possibility of human progress and moral reform as a part of human history. We dare not fall prey to pessimism or nihilism or some Malthusian acceptance of war and disease and oppression as permanent features of human destiny. Hope in the possibility of peace is the very meaning of our messianic belief. Now, can the long story of Jewish-Christian hatred and conflict be transformed into this covenantal partnership? I don't know. Right? And certainly, critical theological differences must always remain between Jews and Christians and Judaism and Christianity. But both faiths are committed to a belief in messianic history and a belief in action to make a place in the world for God to enter. In that covenantal task, we share this great mission. So God asks us to repair his world through the covenant, the full realization of which the Rambam, at the very end of his great legal work, the Mishnah Torah, described as follows. At that time, there'll be no hunger, there'll be no war, there'll be no jealousy, and no strife. Blessings will be abundant, and comfort will be within the reach of all. The single preoccupation of the entire world will be to know God. Therefore, there will be wise people who will know mysterious and profound things and will attain the understanding of God to the utmost of human capacity. As it is written in Yeshayahu, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. If Jews and Christians can become partners after 2,000 years of theological delegitimization and physical conflict, then peace is possible between any two people, between any two peoples. This is the great hope. The peace, that peace would be our most powerful witness to the presence of God in human history and the fulfillment of our joint covenantal responsibility. Thank you. Yes, after, yes. after the presentations. Okay, it's a, it's a great privilege um, to introduce uh, someone who has become a, indeed, a Yadid Nefesh to me. That's uh, Rabbi Dr. Naftali Rotenberg, um, who will give the next paper. His, his paper is entitled Three Forms of Otherness, Covenant Mission and Relation to the Other in Rabbinic Perspectives. Naftali Rotenberg is a senior research fellow at the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute and has been such since 1994. He also serves as the rabbi of Har Hadar, a Jerusalem suburb, suburb where he resides with his family. He has published numerous articles and 11 books on philosophy, Jewish thought and Jewish law. His most recent books are The Wisdom of Love, Man, Woman, and God in Jewish Canonical Literature, the Rabbi in the New World, the Influence of Rabbi Joseph B. Soloveitchik on Culture, Education, and Jewish Thought, published by the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute. It's hot off the press. I urge all of you to buy the book. Um, and uh, it's my great pleasure to, to give the podium to R Rabbi Dr. Rotenberg. Yes, that, uh, that book was um, co-edited, uh, Naftali co-edited that book with uh, Avi, Dr. or Professor Avi Noam Rosenak, you know, who's a fellow here at the Van Leer Institute. Uh, actually, I want to use this opportunity uh, before I go to the paper uh, to uh, a sincere uh, thanks to, first of all, to my colleagues uh, that uh, we worked together in the last, over the last uh, two years. Uh, for me, it was uh, not only that I learned so much from you, it was a learning experience, but I live in permanent learning experience here and elsewhere, but it was actually a re-educated experience. You brought me more and more close to 
the theological discourse that I heard, I learned, I was visiting in uh, divinity schools like Chicago and others, but such experience I never had. And uh, so I like to thank you very much. And I am here in a strange situ situation because before I uh, presented my paper, already we heard all the comments on the paper <laughs> from uh, Professor Jensen and uh, from Rabbi Korn. And uh, first I want to say that this uh, paper was developed. The, the first one uh, to help me to enter uh, to, to, to the work in the group was uh, a Professor uh, 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 Lindbeck, Lindbeck George, George Lindbeck, that uh, when, he, when he felt I, how I feel strange in the environment of the group and in the, this kind of discourse, he asked me, please, define to us what bother you. So this will be the, the beginning of the work, and it's helped me very much. And a lot of emails between uh, Professor Jensen and myself, comments that you heard already, the comments in the presentation of Professor Jensen, uh, brought me to what I have in my hands. Uh, the question in our uh, group discourse, as I understood it, was about theological interpretations of the concepts of covenant and mission in Christianity and Judaism, and the place of the other as an outcome of these interpretations. In relation to this, I am busy now, so I am not going to answer. In, <laughs> in relation to this uh, discourse, one can ask if Bible or Bible ethos related religions understand their covenant with God as exclusive, can recognize the other place still as other under the definitions of these two uh, concepts. I had to deal here with two main obstacles. The first one was that it is impossible to present a meaningful theological argument on rabbinic tradition simply because it is not theological tradition. A discourse focused exclu exclu exclusively on, the on theology would always be limited on the Jewish side to a very small marginal group. So it's not that I don't accept the approach and the ideas of all my colleagues, and especially Rabbi uh, Korn and Professor Jensen. I accept. i actually happy to be part. Personally, I'm happy. I'm not stuck in some box, but I look at the reality. I look at the Jewish people. I look at the rabbi. I listen to them. So I cannot close my eyes and think that your wonderful idea or even the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the ideas that you just, uh, uh, Rabbi Kohn said from Rabbi Emdin and, uh, and uh, Shimshon and Fahel Hirsch, will change the situation. So I want to challenge this situation. So this is the first obstacle, that the rabbinic approach, it's not theological. These are our rabbis, for good and for better. The second obstacle is the rabbinic interpretation itself to the concept of covenant and mission. And I speak not on rabbinic interpretation in the only in the last uh, 20 years or 50 years or 100 years. I look at all our midrashim and interpretation through either the generation. In my article I have shown that in the Jewish tradition, the concept of covenant is generally one of isolation, exclusion, and separation between do, those who are member, members of the covenant and the, those who are not. This means that the covenant can be, be the starting point for a discussion 
of attitude toward the other or a foundation for common denominator between Jews and other monotheistic communities. I have shown too that the mission, this is the second term, observing the precepts distances Jews from those who do not share the Torah and precepts with them and erects a wall seemingly impassable between Jews and non-Jews and in uh, modern uh, uh, times between observant and non-observant Jews as well. These backgrounds offer a far from comfortable point of departure for a discussion of the attitude toward the other in general and toward uh, the, the, the Christian other in particular. Now, both, uh, both Abraham's covenant and God, with God and the covenant at Sinai between Israelites and God in rabbinic interpretation uh, throughout a thousand years exclude all others. The implementation of those co covenant the mission of, of observing the precepts reinforce this exclusion and give it concrete form in daily life. There are three common ways of responding to these obstacles. The first one is recognizing total segregation and per perpetuating the other as the enemy on the Carl Schmitt uh, uh, interpretation, as non-existent or as irrelevant. We had yesterday night, actually, a presentation, actually, a real presentation to this approach on specific issue. The second is attempting to, in, to interpret the notion of covenant in a different way and to ne ne neutralize it, its isolationist sense. At the same time, to ignore the mission, the obligation to comply with hundreds of precepts whose practical imp import is to isolate the Jew from the non-Jew or to highlight, uh, or other ways to highlight the mission as tikkun olam, reforming the, reforming the world, and in, in this way to export it from the obligatory uh, particle, particularistic and communal milieu into the area spaces of universalism. And now the third approach, trying to deal with isol isolationist uh, significance of the covenant and mission as they really are and acquiring whether the self-segregation and exclusion are hermetic or whether the rabbis have produced positive and constructive models that can apply to the other. Now, the first path uh, is, as I said before, common in large Jewish groups. This fa fact I tend, I, I intens, intensifies the challenge I have taken upon myself in this article because it means that any discourse that would make the other present in positive sense run, run, runs up against not only conceptual, textual, and theoretical obstacles, but also a cultural and political conflict with the broad sector. I have many reasons for rejecting this approach of total isolations, is isolationism. For one thing, I believe that it is mistaken for a Jewish, from a Jewish perspective. This approach adds on top of the exclusion, uh, drives, drives from the covenant and mission, the image of the other as the enemy. I refer before, before to Carl Schmitt and in my article in Glenks, as an element unnecessary in my eyes for reinforcing the group identity. For it is moral, nor it is moral. Finally, it is unrealistic. 
That is, it may be realistic to some extent for isolationist uh, groups, but cannot provide an existential solution for the public at, la at, at large. Rejecting this path requires, of course, dealing with it. The second path I even more strongly opposed than I am in the first way. I mean, the ideas of tikkun olam and the universalism, so-called. Uh, those who follow, follow it is responsible for emergence of conceptual dimensions that are divorced from the essential meaning of fundamental concepts such as covenant and mission, as, as well as from the complex social reality. They have nothing but good intentions, but I cannot relieve them from their responsibility for strengthening of the isolationist groups who hold to the first path. The typical uh, themes of this uh, second path are so out of touch and unacceptable that they leave many Jews groups, Jewish groups with no choice but to separate uh, from and exclude the other. Those who pursue the second way do not imagine, of course, that they are responsible for processes within isolationist, isolationist groups. From super, uh, superficial reading of sociological uh, trends, they believe that these groups relate directly to the non-Jewish other, but a complex understanding of the process shows that the masses despise the universalist discourse of Jewish elites, both because they cannot understand them and because it is a discourse that is oblivious to the most basic daily features of the culture of the public at large. So, I have chosen the third way, confronting the very real and very significant obstacles to dealing with the other, examining the fortified wall for gates and drawbridges that were always intended to serve as a built-in passageway and not uh, something uh, cobbled on a, la on a ladder within existing systems of partic particularistic culture and that are an integral part thereof. I have identified three forms, but there are many more. I work only on three in this, uh, uh, in this work. I have identified three forms of attitude toward the other. The first model, you can see it in detail in the papers, Rabbi Akiva's, is a complex process at those conclusion every Jew can make the other, every non-Jewish human being, present in their own world. The advantage of Rabbi Akiva's model is that despite its complexity, it is based on a realistic principle. It does not allow to reject the other with the assertion that accepting him would require sacrificing uh, oneself or sacrificing another Jew. This model is constructed in a foundation of fulfilling our obligations toward ourselves, toward our family, toward our people, toward our people. It would be difficult even for isolationists groups to object to it because it does not come at their expense. The defect of this model may be that it leaves the other faceless and unspecific. We need only the claim that he or she was created in the image of God. This was the uh, the words of Rabbi Akiva, that is, even though we are referring to some others, to some other who is specific individual, we accept him because Rabbi Akiva assigned him to the universalism of the faceless divine image. And this is, and in this sense, he is no long, longer the other. 
The second model is Rabbi Meir's. It challenges separation from the other precisely when such isolation could be understood and even justified morally. Rabbi Meir shows a way to create discourse and dialogue with, ultimate, uh, with the ultimate other who seems to, th uh, to threaten his own path, who does not share his faith and does not observe the precepts. Rabbi Meir's attitude to Acher, other, rests on the intellectual collaboration, the study of the Torah, a shared culture, that of the house of study, that Acher, Elisha ben Oveya, left the house of study, but still they share the, this framework. <coughs> and mutual responsibility, mutual responsibility, the way to relate to, to the ultimate other as they both have res feel responsible to each other. He feel, may you feel, responsibility to pursue Acher to return to the straight path and believes that, that uh, severing all ties with him would be irresponsible action. There is no danger that Rabbi Meir himself will fall because the other, his teacher, that now left the way, Elisha ben Avuya, uh, also feels responsibility toward him, uh, manif manif manifested uh, in his uh, unwillingness to allow Rabbi Meir to violate his principles and desecrate the Sabbath on his, on his account. So it's a mutual responsibility. In this model, the other retains his identity as other and an individual, just as Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Meir does not deviate from his own path. The shortcoming of this model is that it fails the public test for broad part of the community who cannot discern all the fine points of the participants' conduct, Rabbi Meir crossed a red line and is plunging into the depths of obli obliv uh, oblivion. Only an apologetic defense arrests th this fall and returns him to the warm bosom of the community consensus. So, following Rabbi Meir's way of making the other present in your life, you, you need to be, uh, to prepare yourself to pray a big price. It's not simple. The third model is based on the seven Noahide precepts. This model creates an immediate collaboration between non-Jews and Jews in the mission, in the observance of the precepts, and even in the covenant. If the non-Jew observe these precepts as divine commands, and the source was, it's the Tosefta, and the Tosefta itself, it's written, and seen my paper that you edited, yes, in the Tosefta itself, it's written that, uh, that when a, a, a non-Jew that that uh, uh, do the seven Noahide uh, precepts, it's, uh, ma it's it, it's Because about, of revelation. Yes, revelation, no. And, and the Jew, that violent one or few, is not in his level. So, so this, is, this is very early, uh, uh, very early idea. The advantage of this model is that it can be accepted by very broad sectors and that it is hard to dismiss it. And because it was, we, we heard about it from so many papers in this, I suggest that uh, it's a recommendation that we, we need to develop and to go profound to the idea, to understand it more and more, because this, I think, we, we need to do enough in our work. It's a subject for itself, 
and it, it is very interesting. And we cannot say only that this is the basis for moral life, because there are moral life without, without religion at all existed. There are many moral people that has nothing to do with religion. So we have to understand, we have to go profound, and maybe use even your theological uh, tools to go and to understand as a as, as subject for itself. It, it does not demand uh, on, for, for the masses, for the public, for the, for the majority of rabbis, a philosophical or theological depth, and it is not complex. The Jew remains the Jew. The other remains other. But is, it, it is at the same time they are partners in the observance of the, of the divine injunctions and active on the same plane. Not only does this approach respect particular and individual milieus of each group and of each individual within it, it even reinforces it. The consequence is that the otherness, however isolating and separating it may be, can at the same time be the basis for existence in a genuine common denominator among human beings. Thank you very much. Oh, yes. Where is Yochi? And now again I'm replacing uh, Dr. Yochi Fischer and have the pleasure uh, to introduce No, oh, this is not this. I can self-introduce. No, I will introduce it. <coughs> you know, we're in the Mediterranean area. We need to give the, the, yes. the respect. Uh, <laughs> so we now it's self-introduced. Uh, okay, my friends, uh, Ruben, Borg, Ruben Borg is a lone research fellow and uh, lecturer in English literature in Hebrew University of Jerusalem. His articles on modernism have appeared in numerous journals, uh, and there is a very long list. You can see it in the, our site. Uh, uh, he is currently working on a book for uh, Rodopi Press, uh, titled Fantasies and Self-Mourning. And... Uh, the title for the presentation, and I, and I understand that it will be as a comment to our mm -hmm. uh, presentation, is being historical now, modernity between hermeneutics and revelation. Dr. Wovenborg, please. Good morning. Uh, in pitching my response to the three papers we just heard, I would like to abstract two general senses of the word covenant. Does my voice reach? Does my voice reach? Yeah. Um, the covenant as a relationship between God and his people, and the covenant as an event that kickstarts a particular history. These senses are not in conflict, but are in fact, as our pa panel has shown, complementary. The object of my talk today will be to elaborate on these two senses, and by way of that, to discuss why the concept of the covenant is important for contemporary letters or for the humanities at large, since we are talking, after all, of hope for the human future. I should like to begin by saying a few words about theology as a discipline. I will do this not in order to establish my credentials as a theologian, but to set forth a couple of working assumptions to make explicit, as it were, the biases and responsibilities of my argument. The first word concerns the possibility of a dialogue between theology and its sisters, philosophy and literature. Let us remember that in the Republic of Letters, we now call the humanities, theology used to enjoy a certain pride of place, a place it lost to philosophy sometime in the 18th century. The story is well known and is of little interest per se. Enrollment statistics show theology faculties being downgraded everywhere in Europe as the traditional tripartite offering prevalent in numerous institutions, theology, law, and medicine, began to be replaced by something re resembling the modern curriculum. Theology's claims as a science were also being challenged at this time 
suffice it to quote Baron Dahlbach's scathing rejection of the entire discipline as, I quote, a pretended system founded on principles propagated by enthusiasm or knavery, a tissue of fallacies and contradictions. By the end of that century, Dolbach's highly influential writings would prompt Kant to mount the following half-hearted defense. We can grant theology's proud claim that philosophy is its handmaid, though the question remains whether the servant carries her lady's torch or her train behind. By contrast, for the likes of William of Ockham, Thomas Aquinas, Albertus Magnus, even Dante, the distinction between philosophy and theology would have made no sense at all. The reason I bring up this issue is to remark on the current specificity of theology as a discipline, and to note that if theology overlaps with, our fields in the with other fields in the humanities today, if it lends its terms and its concerns to poetry or philosophy, it does so in a different manner than in, say, Dante's time. Dante's education famously proceeds upwards from autobiography to the solace of reason personified by Virgil, and finally to theological catechism, which is the section that we are experiencing specifically in this conference. Each stage implies a movement towards truth, a philosopher's and pilgrim's progress that organizes the different discourses involved autobiography, classical reason, theology, into an obvious hierarchy. What happens, when, what happens when such a hierarchy is jettisoned? How should we read the occurrence of terms such as covenant, revelation, or charity in contemporary philosophy and letters? This brings me to my second observation, that if a theological ghost is haunting philosophy and literature today, the communication between disciplines remains as uncertain as ever. Theological issues have indeed become prominent in contemporary thought, most famously in the work of Alain Badiou, Jacob Taubes, and Giorgio Agamben, and more recently in an almost predictable tag-along, also Slavoj Žižek. All four writers propose a return to Paul, and all four view Paul as a revolutionary figure, the bearer of a new covenant, and the founder of a radically new experience of truth. A great, stake is at, as, a great deal is at stake in this debate, but for the sake of this talk, I shall single out two angles of interpretation. The first is political, and reprises some of the concepts addressed in our panel concerning matters of election and membership. Paul's apparent aim in the epistle to the Romans is to promote a doctrine of inclusiveness and universalism. But the text's polemical thrust is, of course, directed towards a transcendence of both Jewish law and Roman citizenship. A self-styled apostle, self apostle to the Gentiles, Paul challenges the privileged relationship between God and the people of Israel and tests the possibility of universalizing that, that, that privilege, some would say, of hijacking it. Can the past survive such a revolutionary act? Does the epistle to the Romans repeat the covenant at, Sin at Sinai, extending its ten tenure both temporarily and juridically, or does it simply close off one history to inaugurate another one? The question is complicated by the fact that, as was mentioned this morning, the covenant with Israel was never a wholly original event in the first place. Sinai repeats Abraham, who takes up from Noah, who redirects the promise to Adam, in what sense, then, is Paul's covenant an absolute break from the covenants that preceded? it? Might we not think of it as the continuation of a long tradition? It seems to me, and I am aware this is a completely unsatisfactory answer, that the epistle to the Romans wants to be two things at once, both a reaffirmation of the past and a new beginning, conjunction and disjunction. Paul himself seems to promote this double focus in Romans 11, from which I quote, And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. There shall come out of Sion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. 
It is interesting to come upon the word enemies again in this context, to find that for Paul, enemy and beloved are indeed in conflict, but not contradictory or mutually exclusive determinations. Enemy of the gospel, but beloved of God. If you think about it, there is nothing in this definition that runs counter to Jewish self-understanding, or for that matter, to a Christian understanding of the Jewish other. In a sense, Paul is trying to have his cake and to eat it, to be an honest Jew who honors the forefathers and the founder of a new people to boot. Um, to be sure, I don't mean to suggest here that Paul harmonizes Jewish and Christian traditions, but rather that he inhabits the disjunction or embodies it, if you will, from both sides. And in this, more than in his ambition to produce a modern covenant, lies the undeniable violence of his universalist politics. So much then for the political dimension of the Paul debate. The second ang angle I would like to consider concerns the experience of truth itself, its nature and the manner of its inception in history. In this case, interpretation hinges as much on textual exegesis as on a correct understanding of Paul's literary persona. Paul's self-presentation as a religious convert, as a charismatic leader, even as an epic hero who returns from the realm of the dead to be born again, sets up the possibility of his identification, first with Moses, then with the res resurrected Christ. Let us not forget that Paul stakes the full authority of his message on this dual identification, which is everywhere in his writings. We cannot understand him at all without taking this identification seriously, as the only standard of truth in life, the one hermeneutic principle that would allow anyone, including Paul himself, to believe his own testimony. The most striking example of this method is probably found in the second epistle to the Corinthians, in which Paul recounts of his numerous near-death, if not actual death, experiences, followed by a vision of the third heaven. Once again, his strategy is to affirm that he is as Jewish and as Christian as any who claim to speak in the name of Christ. I quote from the letter to the Corinthians. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I more. In labors more abundantly, in prisons more abundantly, in stripes above measure, in deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day have I been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of rivers, in perils of robbers, in perils from my countrymen, in perils from the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. And a few lines later, I know a man in Christ 14 years ago. He's talking about himself. Whether in the body I know not, or whether out of the body I know not, God knoweth. Such a one caught up even to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I know not, God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. On behalf of such a one will I glory, but on mine own behalf I will not glory, save in my weaknesses. Whether the journey to the other world was corporeal or out of body, Paul leaves it to his followers to decide. To him, the matter seems scarcely relevant. Did he truly ascend to paradise to return with the good news? And also, what does truly mean in this sense? Can an apostle speak on behalf of Christ without going through the harrowing process of death and resurrection? These questions cannot be asked in earnest today. Yet they give shape to one of the decisive controversies in the history of Christianity an issue upon which the very definition of allegorical truth, the distinction between allegoria in facto and allegoria in verbis, the allegory of the theologians and the allegory of the poets, seems to depend. Uh, uh, this idea of allegorical truth is particularly important in that it takes up and complicates, I think, the question of the facticity of the resurrection to which Professor Jensen drew our attention earlier this morning. In this connection, consider also the apocalypse of Paul, 
an apocryphal text from the 6th century, which tells of Paul's journey beyond the third heaven all the way to the 10th. Uh, this text was, uh, is now apocryphal, but for a long time uh, in the history of Christianity, it was, it was one of the texts that were uh, considered uh, as part of the Acts of the Apostles. Paradoxically, it is here through the problem of allegorical truth and its relation with facticity uh, that the modernity of Paul comes properly into focus, and so too the relevance of his theology to contemporary philosophy. Through Pauline mediation, the covenant becomes a figure for truth itself, but a specific order of truth, truth at the intersection of hermeneutics and revelation. Even in a secular context, the question today remains, how can truth be translated from a divine to a human language? Or to reappropriate one of the titles from this morning's session, what kind of truth would need a history, and how would it go about purchasing it? This is not the place to compare different answers to those questions, but it is important to register the fact that in turning to Paul as the object of their debate, Badiou, Taubes, and Agamben make a counterintuitive choice, a choice that compels them to reflect on their method and their mission as philosophers. Thus, Badiou finds it necessary to explain that his reading of Paul is, I quote, not in the field of religious hermeneutics. My relation to Paul does not involve faith or the church. It is, strictly speaking, a relation to the text of Paul and nothing else. I read Paul not at all as a sacred text, as a revelation or something religious. Instead, I read Paul as a text about a new and pro provocative conception of truth, and more profoundly, about the general conditions for a new truth. This is why I do not read Paul differently than I would a great mathematical text or a great artistic testimony. That was but you. And speaking in a different vein, but addressing similar concerns, Taubes writes, I have to justify in a few words why Paul concerns me as a philosopher. Why do I venture onto theological territory? I think the isolation of the theology departments is disastrous. These disavowals can be read as a symptom that disciplinary boundaries are once again under pressure. Indeed, they have been for some time. I believe that a radical reconfiguration of the philosophy, literature, theology triad has been at issue since the 20th century, and that in fact such a shift coincides with an extended cultural moment spanning modernism and its immediate aftermath and reaching into the present. For the purpose of this talk, I shall refer to this moment as modernity, a problematic term, I am aware of that. The word is good for all seasons, but it conveys better than any other a sense of utmost urgency vis-a-vis -vis the historical present, which is the feature that concerns me here. In the time that remains, I would like to return to my earlier claim that a call is in place to redefine the relations between philosophy, literature, and theology, and that even in a secular hermeneutic context, the question for all three remains, how can truth be translated from a divine to a human language? I shall try to flesh out this hypothesis with a few observations on the current cultural moment. As I already mentioned, my understanding of the modern moment is that it is characterized by a hyper-awareness of its own historical condition. The now marks an excess of self-consciousness, an overextension, if you will, of the project of Hegelian history. Co-implied with this, with this state of affairs is the idea that divine and human temporalities the time of providential history and the time of human existence are irredeemably out of sync. This diagnosis resonates with Benjamin's thesis on messianic time, with T.S. Eliot's theory of poetic consciousness, with Derrida's twin notions of the secret and the promise, but also with Joyce's concept of epiphany and Blanchot's allegory of the instant of my death. All these figures take their place at the intersection of our three discourses and provide a crucial context to the Paul debate. I couldn't possibly do, ju do justice to the various writers mentioned here, or to any single one of them for that matter. Let me just note briefly and by way of an abstract that all of them display some combination of the following four features. A, an interest in apocalyptic theme themes and end of history scenarios. B, a fascination with the myth of Orpheus or with the topos of poetry as a means of communicating with the dead. C, a commitment to the event-like character of truth and D, a sense that as an event, 
truth exceeds traditional hermeneutic strategies and exposes thought to an experience akin to what Dante would, would call the grace of theological knowledge. Here's where the covenant takes on a key allegorical significance for contemporary letters. It calls for a renewed communication between two mismatched temporalities. It raises the possibility of such communication, but not on the basis of any available grammar. Invariably, covenants come into being to renegotiate reality, to redirect historical projects in their entirety. The lesson for modernity, that overextended moment in the history of consciousness, is that we are always in need of a new contract. The possibility of a real future, be it for some or for all, inclusive or exclusive, depends on this condition that every now, poised between human experience and revelation, might be at least potentially a foundational event. Okay. Thank you, Ruvain. Uh, we'll we started a bit late, so we'll go to 12.15, and that will leave approximately 30 minutes for questions and discussions of the questions. And we'll proceed as we did last night. Um, we'll give priority uh, questions to the fellows of the Institute and the fellows at Van Leer. Um, we will take two or three questions at a time, um, and then we'll have uh, responses. And again, I caution you, or I ask you um, to ask a question not to make a presentation. Um, and please uh, indicate to, who you're, to whom your question is addressed. Yes, uh, Professor McDermott. Um, well, first to Professor Bork, thank you very much for a stimulating paper. I was struck by how you focused on these recent philosophers who have focused on Paul. And they, if, if I hear you correctly, they present him as someone who is um, wanting to do something so completely new that he transcends um, law. Um, and, and what, well, well what, let's, let me continue. Yeah. And, and particularly focusing on Romans, and, I'm gonna, and my question to you is whether you think it's an accurate reading of Romans when um, Romans, in contrast to Galatians, is particularly an affirmation of law, particularly in Romans 3 and Romans 7. The law is just and holy and good. And then I have a question for uh, Professor Rothenberg and also Korn. Uh, if I'm reading you correctly, and I may not be, it struck me that um, whereas... Um, um, Professor Jensen, with almost all Christians, wants to say we Christians are part of the Abrahamic covenant. And if, if, I'm, re if I'm hearing you correctly, and tell me if I'm not, and that's my question, um, Professor Korn, uh, while acknowledging difficulties, says yes, and, and, and Professor Rothenberg says no wants to limit it uh, to the Noahide commandments. And so that's my question. Okay. Um, and then uh, Rabbi Riskin. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much to all. Just one very brief question to Professor Rothenberg. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little m bit more when you were talking about the Noahide laws. Uh, you said that, that they could be a basis if they were accepted as divine commands. And I'd be grateful if you were to elaborate a little bit more on the extent to which, in, in the structure that you're developing, the Noahide laws work only to the extent to which they are accepted as divine commands. And then what then would be the status, for better or worse, of natural law? Um, or would, sorry, say even in the, in, the, in the Jewish natural law traditions of Maimonides, Albo, et cetera, be part of these highly intellectualized constructs that don't speak to the masses, or would they have some other status? I also thank you. Well, it's very interesting that um, 
everyone seems to have come to a almost clear conclusion that the area in which we can all agree to work together is the ethical area. And uh, that's true of Paul as well, I think. You would say the same thing is true of Paul, especially since uh, he rejected, let's say, the laws for the world at large, although I would argue, long Professor McDermott, that for the, for the uh, Jews, we can continue with, with the laws, and they are perhaps very important for us as well as for him. But um, the difficulty was the theology that he insisted upon for the Gentiles. And we'll hear later on, I think, uh, that within the Bratislav tradition of Yisrael Odessa and uh, even perhaps the Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Sechet Sadik Levracha, from our perspective, there may also be a bit of a resurrection involved as well and uh, connection with the dead and uh, another messianic figure, an earlier messianic figure. And therefore, it, it brings Paul, I think, into very real modern perspective. But my real question is to Rabbi Korn. Um, two things. First of all, I think that, that it's not only that we've become a traumatized nation, I think we've taken upon ourselves a beaten wife syndrome. And we don't understand the importance and the greatness, really, of our tradition. I think we can't imagine that, or at least the Haredi world can't imagine that the non-Jews would want to come to us. And anyway, they'll probably go to hell because they can't keep it all. And um, I think it's much more of the beaten wife syndrome, even. Uh, and we've lost our own feelings, good feelings about about the covenant. Uh, and therefore, it's universal validity. But I think there was a fundamental contradiction because you opened with Maimonides and his rationalism, and therefore the mitzvot must have great import. And I think that's correct, absolutely correct. Uh, and, and it's interesting that he concludes Mishnah Torah, the goal of his book of commandments, in effect, which is Mishnah Torah, his halachic compendium becomes the perfection of society and the days of the Messiah, which is true. But yet, when you speak about our mission to the world, our mission to the world is very much limited to the Noahide laws plus God. And here... I must say, within the, the, the world view of Maimonides, where Maimonides gives our responsibility to bring some kind of covenantal message to the world, his proof text, the third commandment, is loving God. And he says very clearly at the outset of that, the definition, Loving God means knowing God, and you know God through the commandments and God's actions in the world, which would seem to me, to me at least, that, again, at least according to Maimonides, the goal would be not to coerce the Gentiles, and it's not a necessary obligation for us to do that, but certainly it would be salutary for us to share the commandments. And Maimonides is the one who says, all commandments have equal status. And therefore, all must be salutary and all must be positive. Um, okay. I, I would also say, just finally, my question to Rabbi Rothenberg is that you make a distinction between the rabbis and theology. However, the rabbis, whether they are or they are not theologians, can't help but read the prayers, although maybe they don't internalize them and truly take them seriously. But the areas like the 
Kulam Yekablu O Malchutecha, all of them will accept the yoke of your kingship, which is part of our Olenu prayer, and certainly is far more far reaching than uh, just seven Ohide laws. Well the Takeno Lamba Malchut Shakai to perfect the world in the kingship of God, I think their problem is they just don't don't internalize and take these things seriously. But I think our tradition through the centuries certainly did. Okay. Um, let's, let's give us an opportunity for responses, and then we'll have another round of questions. I'm, there's a lot to talk about here, quite obviously. Um, in terms of, uh, just let me respond to, to Professor McDermott. You read me correctly. That What I am trying to say is that, is that not only ethically, but I think theologically, um, it is very consistent to see Christianity in some sense within the Abrahamic covenant. I haven't worked it out. There are issues, there are details that need to work out with circumcision, etc. But I read these very traditional Orthodox rabbis as saying exactly that. They understood the Abrahamic mission to be one thing, and then when they described the salutary effect of Christianity and the influence of Christianity, on world culture, it's identical to the Abrahamic mission. Yes. Um, I don't know if, if, if you want to respond to Professor McDermott's uh, comments about Paul and about how he read each of our responses. Uh, uh, well, uh, first of all, I, I, I thank you for the comments, and I agree, I agree completely. I, I, I should perhaps have emphasized more the fact that the, the different philosophers all agree that Paul is an important figure, and they agree that he's a revolutionary figure. Um, but they interpret Paul differently. But if I sort of if I sort of didn't make that clear, I, I apologize for that. And um, the differences in interpretation um, concern the question of uh, whether. Paul's gesture is a universalist gesture, um, or whether it can, even as a revolutionary uh, text, be recuperated within the um, Jewish tradition. Um, so that, that, that I think, is a, is a point that, that, that seems to me to be important to make. Um, there, Taubes would emphasize the fact that Paul, despite being a revolutionary figure, is uh, committed to the Jewish tradition can be uh, seen as coming from there. Whereas, uh, for instance, Badiou would, would deny that and emphasizes more the universalist gestures of Paul. And yes, I think Badiou particularly would agree with you uh, uh, on the fact that uh, the concept of law uh, continues to be operative in, 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 uh, in Paul. So I, 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 agree with, I agree with the point and I think your objection stems from, from my um, not having emphasized the differences between the different philosophers enough. Um, and I take it on board. Natalie, does, does... Not sure whether there was some uh, questions happened a while ago and I may have forgotten mm -hmm. some aspect of, your, your, of the issue that you brought up. Uh, Natalie, do you want to uh, respond to uh, Professor McDermott's does he read you correctly? Yes. My understanding of uh, Abraham Covenant, it's not only because of rabbinic interpretation throughout the generations, but only because what is simply written there and everyone reading. We have nine times the word covenant that, that God uh, uh, created with, with Abraham. And... Uh, and uh, four of these nine times, the same verses, yes, in the same issue, is the circumcision. So this is the, the expression of the covenant. And in the last time, it says that this person who is not circumcised is, will not be part of the household of Abraham. So this is a very, very exclusive covenant. Okay? So, uh, so this is uh, my answer to your question is yes and yes, actually. And uh, in the same time, uh, this is a comment 
to, to your presentation, uh, Rabbi Korn, uh, uh, you said, and I agree, Abraham wasn't a Jew. He wasn't a Jew. He was, he was even from the Israelites. Abraham was a person uh, that God uh, uh, made with him a covenant. And this covenant, it was, I just uh, explained. And uh, you want me to respond to Rabbi uh, Risky now? Okay. Uh, first of all, to, to, uh, to, to Yuda. Dr. Mersky. Yes, so, uh, so uh, Yuda, you, you are absolutely right. In the Tosefta, which is the earlier source for, for rabbinic source for the uh, Noahide uh, precepts, uh, it's written clearly that, first of all, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's acceptable and very positive when every uh, Gentile uh, 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 complete the seven Noahid uh, um, um, uh, precepts, uh, commandments. But if he's doing so as a divine command, he will have, uh, will live after life as, as the Israelites, as the children of Israel. So he will be like Israel, like, like the Israel. So, so bring them, the Tosefta at least, yes, without any influence of the Kabbalah, as we spoke yesterday, yes, the Tosefta is it, bring Gentiles to the same level in the, in the life after life, in the place after life, uh, those who are completing the seven ayats uh, uh, for, for, uh, for a divine command. But if they do so, uh, not because of divine command, it's a very, very positive way of life, which is the base of morality. <coughs> Ah, and to Rabbi Riskin, uh, look, I follow you, and I want to study from you more about this, and, 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 and I see, but what I can do, the rabbis, and the majority, and you know it, because you, you live here in this establishment as I had much, you know, and for many years they don't see it in this way. This is the fact. So it's a positive interpretation, but they don't accept it. They... They think about other issues when they do the prayers, and I want them to undermine their prayers because I'm not. Uh, uh, but, but they are not. What, it's not. We cannot bring a pray or a source and to say what you do with this. They will do it. They will interpret it, even if if it be a lack so in supporting of uh, accepting the other as Christian as uh, whatever. They will reject it because they reject it. Okay. And if if I could respond uh, first to, to Professor Rodenberg and then um, more directly to my teacher, Rabbi Riskin. Um, Naftali, I was not advocating some kind of, of uh, unbounded, untrammeled universalism in, in trying to find a place for a covenantal relationship with Christianity. Um, the truth is that what's really required is, is a balance or a dialectic. The Torah says we are supposed to be mamlechet koanim, which is a universal concept, and a goy kadosh, which is, means that we're supposed to be separate. Now, those, uh, on a logical, strictly logical analysis, you have this contradictory set of commands and notions. But what sometimes is logically contradictory is spiritually true. And that what the, the real spiritual challenge is to try to find a right balance between between staying separate and yet not cutting ourselves off from the world entirely. And that's not an easy balance to achieve. I think I agree with Rabbi Riskin that we've gone too far in the direction of, of isolation. Um, look, you know, uh, another teacher of mine, David Hartman, once said that the most tragic figure in the Bible is God. Where he, his children are constantly disappointing him. You know, God asks us to be a mamlechet koanim, to be, to be an agent of bracha to the world, right? And perhaps we, the Jewish people, in living the covenant, have disappointed God in that regard. Now, it's very understandable because of historical circumstance. I understand completely, you know, why we would want to withdraw because of the pain of history. But yet, God still asks this of his children. Now, are we up to it? 
only time will tell. And, and all we can do is, you know, to, to understand the Word of God as best we can and to try to live it and to teach it. And hopefully people, other people will also see the cogency and the nobility of that kind of a program. Now, in my response to, to Rabbi Riskin, um, yes, there is a certain contradictory notion here. And in fact, you know who was caught in contradiction? Was Maimonides himself. In the text that you quoted last night at the very end of the Mishnah Torah where he says that, in fact, uh, Jesus and the uh, Yishma Ali, that is, Muhammad, have served to spread the word of mitzvot, of commandments, and of God, and the Messiah, all of these Jewish notions have now reached the farthest corners of the earth. The introduction to that passage is very strange. Maimonides says it's impossible for human beings to understand the ways of God, right? Because his thoughts are not our thoughts, and his ways are not our ways. Why does Maimonides say that? Because for Maimonides, it's inexplicable, it's a contradiction how Christianity which is idolatry to Maimonides. It's a vodah zarah, and, and therefore is the source of falsehood and truth on a theological level, should not be the agent of spreading truth in history. But Maimonides has great intellectual integrity and can't deny that obvious fact. So he himself is caught in contradiction. And lastly, with respect to the, to the, the source that you quoted in Sefer Mitzvot, Mitzvah uh, say Gimel, if you read that carefully, at least I read it carefully and understand him, he's not talking about behavior and mitzvot. His paradigm is Avraham. That's why he quotes Nefesh uh, uh, Asher Asu. Avraham did not keep mitzvot, at least not the mitzvot of Sh Avraham did not keep, according to Rambam, he's very explicit on this in Hilchot Melachim Perik Tet, Halacha Aleph. He kept the Sheva Mitzvah of B'nai Noach and he circumcised his family. He did not keep Taryag Mitzvot. And therefore, in Mitzvot say in Sefer Mitzvot, his paradigm is Avraham. We are supposed to be Abrahamic teachers to the world, teach the world about Sheva Mitzvah B'nai Noach and the reality of the creator of heaven and earth. That's the way I read that. Not to eat matzah on Pesach. Okay. Okay, second, second round of questions. Um, I do want to give the Kahal a chance. So first, uh, Professor Novak and then uh, Dr. Schmidt, and then we'll open it up to the Kahal. Just a, a couple of uh, brief reactions. Number one, to your, to your last remark, Rabbi Korn, I think that it can be definitely shown that Maimonides changed his mind about Christianity because all of the condemnations of Christianity come early in his work, and I think that it could be shown that he clearly uh, changed his mind. Okay, that's, that, that's, that, that's the point there. Uh, uh, Professor Jensen uh, made an interesting point at the very beginning of his paper uh, saying, well, I come from a tradition where covenant is not a very important uh, issue. Uh, actually, there are many uh, Jewish thinkers that covenant is not that important issue either. But interestingly enough, Robert Jensen is a Lutheran theologian. Uh, had his background been closer to his great teacher, Karl Barth, who comes from a Calvinist tradition where covenant plays a very important role, then I think that a Calvinist reading of Paul uh, gives us far more common ground, which is much less antinomian, if you will, than uh, um, a Lutheran reading of uh, Paul. Um, in terms of uh, uh, Robert Roth Rothner's paper and the interesting exchange with uh, uh, my old friend, Dr. Uh, uh, Mursky, the question of divine law is interesting uh, in the reading of the, especially at the, eighth, in the end of the eighth chapter of the of Hilchot Melachim is when Maimonides says that you have to have accepted this as divine law in order to be part of the Olam Abba, which is really the, the theological significance, does he mean there, and it's, it's a disputed text, does he mean that you have to accept divine law as prescribed by Mosaic revelation or only as described by Mosaic revelation? In other words, do you have to accept it as divine law because you've accepted basically Mosaic revelation or you've come to, by some kind of natural law reasoning, of a, of a divine source of commandments uh, that is in, that's consistent with Mosaic Revelation. That's a very important uh, 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 distinction uh, there. And, and finally, to, uh, to uh, Dr. Bork, who uh, somebody knew I've had the pleasure of meeting for the first time, I think your discussion of theology was very interesting at the beginning, uh, but I think that it raises a problem. Um, your 
quite right how theology got kicked out of the, uh, the, of the university curriculum. But that is because there are two senses of theology. I mean, the term theology comes from Aristotle's metaphysics, which is a locus to that, which is human talk about, human God talk. Whereas theology can also come from the Hebrew, Devar Hashem, which means God's word, divine revelation. Now, I think that the problem of the thinkers that you invoked uh, is that they really don't take revelation seriously as a, as, as a, as a phenomenon in and of itself. Carl uh, Jaspers once said that if Kant had understood revelation to be a, an original form of experience, he would have formulated very different categories for it. But it just simply was off his range. So therefore, I think that if there is to be, uh, especially Jewish Christian uh, discussion, even with people like Paul, then it has to be that basically Judaism and Christianity accept a primary revelation, Mosaic revelation, uh, and are, there are most of our history, we're arguing our different interpretations thereof. Now we're doing more that there are tremendous common interpretations uh, thereof. But without that primacy of theology in the Hebraic sense rather than the Hellenic sense, uh, I think that uh, the discussions of people like Badu and, 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 uh, and Taubus and whatever uh, become rather idiosyncratic. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, uh, Dr. Schmidt, and then we'll take some questions from the Kahal. Yeah, thank you very much to your contributions. I, I think that uh, I, I want to ask a question to you. I think it's maybe a question to other participants as well. Um, and picking up from, uh, from Borg's uh, elaboration at the end, from your talk it turns out that we are getting down, as you know, we say here, new frontiers in Jewish and Christian thought. New, fr new frontiers in Jewish and Christian. No, no, no. So put it closer to your mouth. I have to speak back now. You hear me? So back to the question. <coughs> I want to ask a question to you on the uh, um, what you said at the end um, about frontiers. Actually, I mean, we are supposed to uh, discuss. Uh, New frontiers in Jewish and Christian thought, and well, the general express the impression is more or less we get these frontiers down and create new frontiers outside. So it's a new isolationist kind of concept you're presenting, and I think what's important here is to uh, pick up on on uh, Borg's uh, uh, um, elaboration on modernity, because I think we. Modernity cannot ex appear in this discourse here only as the radical secularization, which now the new two friends will oppose to. It has a, a major impact on the very idea of getting down, or of, of putting down our frontiers. And I think without the discourse of modernity and enlightenment, this whole discussion here is impossible, first of all. And second, of course, is now, I think that's the, it comes out, and I think that was another point that you made right now, is that, of course, modernity had its dialectics with religion. It said, well, religion should be part of our freedom and so on, but it, <coughs> in fact, negated religion. It was not really tolerant. But I think modernity went the whole way, and today it's in a position that it is really correcting itself for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons is the new uh, coming up of the discourse on St. Paul, which is an interesting phenomenon. The other is that what Habermas called the problem of legitimation crisis in modernity. Because obviously it seems impossible to go on with modernity without a, a new recognition of its, religion, of its relation to religion, which he calls a post-secular relation. And I do believe that without this post-secular relation of modern enlightenment, our discourse is impossible. Okay? okay. Then the second thing is, I'm not so very much pleased with this uh, putting Islam only into the position of the uh, religious violence. There is religious violence. I think that is a disease all the religion bring with, with them, each in its own portion and its own ways. And we should remember that the whole idea of an enlightenment, a pre-modern enlightenment, as, at least as uh, Leo Strauss would call it, was an initiative of Islam. And I think we should do not only build, get down our own frontiers, but open up frontiers and think how to get along with the different pathologies of secular culture, of religion, and so on, in order to really get down with uh, frontiers. Okay. Uh, someone from 
Uh, yes, this gentleman here. Uh, please identify yourself. And My name is Frank Stokes. <coughs> Pardon me. And we've come from the ends of the earth, really, to, to be at this conference. We're from, from Australia. And I just, I just want to say I'm profoundly grateful for the opportunity to be here and to learn from you gentlemen. I have a question to, the, to both of you, you um, and it's very short, because it is a wonderful thing to discuss these things on high levels and to, to bring all kinds of answers, but how do you envisage to reach the grassroots of Christianity with all this information when at presently the church is becoming increasingly anti-Semitic in, in a practical sense, not theologically, and biblically illiterate? The evidence is there because I'm deeply involved in, in teaching concerning Israel and 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 uh, Israel and the church's indebtedness to to Israel and, and to Judaism. And what we find is people are crying out more and more that they're not being taught in the churches. So how can this information that, that you are, are disseminating now reach the grassroots out there and make an impact? On the, on the grassroots level. Thank you. Okay. And one last question from the Kahal. Uh, yes, this gentleman. Yes. Uh, shalom. Uh, my name is uh, Rabbi Shael Hollander. I deal with Noahides. But I want to just, to just make one remark. Uh, you mentioned twice the Pasuk, you will be a kingdom of Kwanim. I don't like the translation priests, I don't like that, uh, 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 of, Kohan, of Kohanim and a holy people. Uh, I think in you talk, when you talked about the Kohanim, you talked about the blessing that the Kohanim do. But uh, that's only one of the functions and not really one of the most important functions. The, uh, the Torah says in, in uh, Deuteronomy 17.12, the main purpose of the, of, the, of the Kohanim is to stand and to serve, not only God, but to serve the people in, in various ways. One of the ways of serving is to bless, but the, the, the main function of the Kohanim is to serve the people in various ways, as mentioned in the, in the, in the issue of Mitzoraim and other cases where you have a Kohanim coming to do this, to do that, and to do the other thing. And I think the main purpose of the Jewish people is to serve the other people in the world. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right, we've, we've kind of exhausted the, the time, and there's a, a new session coming on at 12.30. So I'm perfectly willing to... At 1.30. Oh, at 1, at 1, I'm sorry. Um, so I'm perfectly willing to stay and to, to respond and answer the questions that were addressed to me personally. Um, but we do have to adjourn now. So thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in the afternoon.